Welcome to Pew Pew Panel with Ava and Chad. Today we're going to discuss a new gun that came out in January. Chad got a cool delivery. And of course, we'll finish our discussion our discussion about the NFA. And uh, joining me is Peaches as well. Always a little distraction, but she's cute, so we keep her around. Uh, Chad, how are you doing today? Do you really want to know? No. Do you really want to know how I'm doing? I know you're probably exhausted. Okay, so I have been, I've made national news. Like you do, I don't know if you know this, but, um, or if you do this, but I get like, I have this Google alert. So anytime that my name is mentioned, then I get an email that like tells me where it was mentioned. So I woke up one day and it was like, literally my name was like listed in like 40 different news outlets and just getting quoted for all of like the anti-gun bills that are hitting Colorado, which was great. I mean, I'm, this is why I did it was to like get the news out and like, wake people up and educate them so that they could take a stand and help us out. Um, then I went on a few radio stations. I was on Newsmax. I went on Colleen Noir's podcast. I mean, it has been nonstop and I'm ready for a vacation and we still have like a month left of the whole bill, the stuff. And it's just great. So yeah. Yeah. It's great. Well, it's spring break and you know, we homeschool, so there is no break. Yeah. It doesn't exist. <laughs> so, like, some of the activities that they do were canceled this week, but somehow we wound up busier than we have been. Yeah. I, I don't know. And I didn't that's, know about the Google thing. That's that's beyond my wheelhouse, I guess. I guess I'm just getting old and technologically uninclined. As I get older, I'm starting to feel like my parents and going, doop, doop, which button do I push? <laughs> well, you know, I got to make sure that my, like, uh, feet finder, you know, uh, profile doesn't get out into the public, you know, so I got to make a, got to keep an eye on that, but no. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Just kidding, just kidding. But actually, you ever Google yourself and see what comes up? It, eh. Like, if you go Ava Flannel, and then it's like, it's always like husband, net worth, height, dad, feet, uh, it's gotten so. Oh, there's OnlyFans at one point. It's gotten some really interesting things. It, it's well, never I haven't, I haven't do searched it. for myself in a while, but I hope that there's not an OnlyFans page or a Feet Finder page. I mean, if finder. there is, hopefully you contact that person and you get at least a percentage, right? That's all um, you get asked. Yeah, my name is kind of it. It's kind of common, so like not a lot really shows up unless you really dig. So yeah, I hear you. Anyways. All right, so we do have some fun stuff that we got in the mail today. I'm going to go first because I'm super excited. Do it. So, don't be jelly, okay? But, you know, I got this cute little box here. And you see that Terran Tactical logo over there? Terran Tactical Innovations, which I don't have any TTI stuff, but I guess I do now. Uh, so, if you guys aren't familiar, they uh, Terran Tactical and Kanik, Kanik, Janak, Johnny, whatever, teamed up and created this uh, Canic pistol. And hold on, let me take this off. I just want to show you guys, like, this box is no joke. It comes with all the stuff. Like, look at this. All right, so you got this. And then you pull this out. And then you got more goodies. And it's like... So many cool stuff. I mean, like, the I have the SFX, which is one of my favorite guns. I talked about it in a previous podcast. But uh, um, just like, you know, in good canic fashion, um, the SFX kind of came with something similar to this. Um, but this one has a lot more, like, just a lot more stuff. I mean, it's so cool. And actually, like, little things that I want to show. So before I show off the gun, um, I don't know if you knew this, but they have these, like, little, this little pistol um which i'm gonna give to peaches but what people don't realize is inside this pistol there is um tools for the optics you just kind of push that out right here and it's got all these tools i don't want to take them all out but isn't that kind of cool barry that's one thing i've always liked about the canics is just all the little details i think I it's pretty cool i know peaches look we got a little pistol for you that's right. She's looking at me. Um, all right, let's talk about the actual pistol, though, because I could just talk about all these, like, little fun things. That, I mean, it even comes with, like, a coin and stuff. But, yes. I don't know. I haven't, I've actually, I've not had time to shoot this. 
but um it looks like they put a lot of work into this and it's also looks like so it's fully ambidextrous oh wait no it's not so the mag release can be switched out but is this a slide lab hold on Yeah. Now I know what it feels like to be left-handed and try to do this with your other hand. Yeah, so cool. So it actually has a slide lock on the on both sides. So that's kind of cool because you don't really see that that often. Um, Optic ready. It did come with an optic. It didn't come, the box doesn't come with an optic. They sent an optic, but of course they sent it to my old address. So I have to get it from my, luckily I, you know, became friends with the girl who bought my house. But um really really nice like i'm really excited to shoot this magazine holds 18 rounds comes with two magazines um one thing that i'm am, i am surprised that i didn't see because i feel like with the sfx it came with different mag plates and this one has one that actually it's two different magazines so they have one that is a little bit more flush and then one that is uh extended but it doesn't add any more i don't think uh because this mag still says 18 rounds but who knows, maybe I'll see how much, if there is a chance that you can add a few more rounds into this extension or if it's just to get a better grip, um, depending on preference. But yeah, I'm pretty excited to try this out. And as always, so one thing that I've been a really big fan of is like, look at this trigger. So so very little very little like reset um small reset and yeah i'm excited for this and chad i'm guessing from your lack of commentary that you're a little jelly but it's okay i'm used to it by now well i'm not jealous <laughs> because there's one of those in the shop for uh oh, whatever. you on the channel Okay, that's right. But I didn't dig into it like you did. I pull the gun out and I log it in and I put it back in the box and get back to work. Well, so, no. Yeah. Sorry, we can't all be cool like me. Uh, we got one too. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I bet so I get my review out sooner than you guys. No, I actually can't say uh, that because it's been so chaotic. I don't know. You might. Yeah. Right, we've been going lately. Um, so I got a little package from Gideon. So a little care package. Got one of their one to 10 guardians in. Ooh. So. I'm going to figure out what I'm going to stick this on and try it out, but um, I haven't really been able to play around with this particular model in hand, but the glass is very, very clear. I mean, yeah. for the price point that these optics come in at is fantastic. And um, in typical fashion, I like to inundate myself with projects. Yeah. So, Wait, yeah. hold on. Did you, real quick before you switched it up, did you get a mount also? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh. Put the optic on the gun with duct tape. Well, yeah, I was going to so. say, because I got a mount, so I'm like, you should have gotten a mount. Yeah, yeah. They sent a... Uh, they sent a 34. Yeah, these are 34s, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Just a cantilever. Cool. Yeah, for your AR and stuff. So, yeah. just flat top. Um, I also, so, yeah, we'll, I we'll mount that up and try it out. I also haven't figured out what I'm going to put mine on yet. I was like looking at my rifles and I'm like, hmm, what can I use this on? But I do agree. It's very nice. Um, I think we should actually probably just talk about Gideon real quick before you sure. talk about your next project. But I think their stuff is just like, I mean, just a home run. I've been really happy with their stuff. Um, I'm trying to switch out a lot of my guns to only have the Gideon optics just because it's so easy to use and it's so convenient has the shake awake or um, the prism, which I've been a really big fan of. And yeah, I mean, so far it just has not, has not let me down at all. So if you guys are looking for something that's like good quality, but you're not going to spend an arm and a leg, I would definitely highly recommend check out GideonOptics.com. That's G I D E O N optics.com and let them know that we sent you. That would be much appreciated. All right, Chad, what are you working on these days? What is that? I know. I know the listeners can't see. That's an AK 80% receiver. Oh. Oh, this, yeah. This is a, I believe this is from a old Bulgarian parts kit. Uh, you know, the AK gurus out there will probably scold me. It may not be, but 
Um, I pressed the barrel out earlier, but this is going to get shortened up to like AK-104 spec, like with a 12 and a quarter, 12 and a half inch barrel, give or take. But this is my first foray into actually like building out an AK. So I got all of the tools in from AK Builder recently. I had the budget to um, get all the riveting jigs and the drilling jigs and all the accoutrement to be able to assemble these things. And I've had a um, a hydraulic press in the shop for a while. I'm like, well, might as well put it to use and gives me something extra to do and some extra services to offer. But um, this build's going to get a triangle folder. Mm, nice. So I'll be uh, updating y'all on the progress of that particular build. Um, yeah, if you want to see it, you'll have to come over to the YouTube page at some point and check it out on either Ava's channel or the PP Panel Podcast uh, YouTube channel. But got a uh, got a AKM Select nice. Fire Fire Control Group. Yeah. So I've got a few of these in now. So this will be a post sample, a fun gun. So. We'll see how it goes. Wish me luck. Very cool. All right. That's cool. All right. Well, moving on with the rest of the show, uh, listener comments. So somebody asked, um, this is from Reacher0613. He said, y'all put on a great podcast. Oh, can't talk. Y'all put on a great podcast. I hope it continues to grow for you guys. This is all the info the gun community as a whole can benefit from knowing. On another note, are you guys familiar with Shadow Systems? Curious what your opinion is of their firearms. I'm familiar. I actually don't own any Shadow Shadow Systems, um, but I've shot their stuff and the gun range slash gun store that I'm an investor of uh, has a lot of their stuff. And I don't know. I don't want to like, I don't want to diss any gun companies. Um, I think that they're very much like a Gucci Glock. And I don't know. I mean, I want to say they're slightly, maybe a little overpriced, but when you think about taking a Glock and doing all the, putting all the upgrades that they have included on their guns, um, you definitely probably end up getting it a lot cheaper, just buying it from shadow systems. But, uh, I don't know. I guess I think that's kind of my opinion. Um, and the more that I've gotten in the industry, the more I've gotten away from Glocks. Whereas like initially when I first started out, I was like, oh, wow, I really like Glocks and like fell into that whole like, let's just, you know, Gucci up all of my Glocks or my, you know, I put together a lot of Palm Radies, stuff like that. So I'm kind of like over that whole thing now. But that said, um, I haven't heard anything bad about shadow systems. They've, they seem to be very reliable and people that own them like them. So kind of, that's like the good and the bad I'd say from my, you know, from my opinion. Well, I've never had any experience with them before. I don't even know if I've had my hands on their guns. Um, but so I can't really speak to that, but I think you did yeah. a good enough job on that. Yeah. They, I mean, they look cool. They've, uh, I mean, they, They've added some like gold barrels and stuff, a little bit of color, but like I would say, like ultimately, it's kind of a Gucci up Glock, and yeah. But and also, I've said this before, honestly, like whatever gun you like and whatever gun you're most likely to use and carry and you know have with you, like that's going to be the best gun. So, and obviously, there's a bunch of guns out there because everyone's different. So, don't let my opinion ruin that for you if that's what you guys like shooting and that's what felt the best for you then by all means you know definitely go out and get it because i have not heard any reliability issues so and if that's the case then i would say it's a good gun all right listener comments uh this is from lawn moan junkie oh lawn moan junkie ava i just saw you on coleon if you can tell me who to write, I will write a letter. I called someone this morning, but they were not answering the phones. I will help. Let me know how. So I really want to say thank you to Cole Noir for having me on his podcast to discuss everything that's going on in Colorado. It's really important that we get the word out because a lot of people have no idea what's going on with all of these bills. They don't even know that these bills exist. So as a result, it's really hard for them to stand up and fight against it. Um, I comprised a, a whole list of who you guys can contact. And even if you're out of state, I would really appreciate it if you guys contacted these people via email because they don't need to know that you don't live in Colorado. But if you go to gunfunny.com and click on the uh, just the homepage, at the very top of the page, you'll see there's a link where it says email every representative. It's going to all of the people, all of the Senate that could potentially vote for this assault weapons bill. 
Um, and in addition, I would say just maybe even make it a little bit more broad and just say do not vote in favor of any anti-gun bill because some of them are also going to be seen. Some of these other bills that are going down the list and there's about nine of them total. Uh, we're getting swarmed. So that's what I would recommend is uh, go to gunfunny.com. And then also Rally for Our Rights has done a really good job of keeping everybody up to date with all the bills. So if you guys want to sign up to testify against that, you can do so. It is confusing how to uh, sign up to testify. If you guys have any questions, just reach out to me. But we definitely need all hands on deck because we are at this point, I think every bill that has been every bill that has been proposed has at least gone through has passed at least one or two steps, and there's seven steps total to go. So um, they haven't become law yet, but we're definitely losing. So I'd appreciate all of the help. Next is oh, and then by the way, when you call them, chances are they're probably not going to answer their phone, and you're going to leave a voicemail, and that's fine too. But it's still they have to tally who is for and against and who says what, so leave a voicemail, blow up their phones, don't just blow up their inboxes. Next is from David Hernandez, ninety nine eighty five. Saw you as a guest in the Carl, Carl Higby. Saw you as a guest in the Carl Higby in the Newsmax TV frontline permission to come aboard. You hit it out of the ballpark in your statement that the radical Dems have made it a privilege to own a weapon nowadays. Ava, we just have to we just have to just wait about seven to eight months to go through the hideous nightmare will be over. Let's remember to vote for Donald J. Trump this November. Um, I did make it to Newsmax. That was probably the most awkward experience of my life. It lasted five minutes. It was done and gone. And I will say I I like Carl. I've had him on my podcast before. Um, But that was like, they sent me like three articles to read that they said we were going to discuss. And we did not discuss them. Instead, he like started off, like put me on the spot. And he's like, what bills do you think are going to pass? And I'm like, uh, oh, well, okay, so far there's this bill. And like totally did not know the bill numbers because I didn't know we were going to discuss that. And yeah, I mean, I just looked like a deer to a headlights. And like before I could do anything else, it was like, okay, thanks. And they like cut me off and got me off the show. <laughs> it was so oh, awkward. Gosh. Yeah. Uh, next is uh, Red Tra, Red, Red T R A, uh, two thirty six. The British accent was pretty good, and that was not my British accent. And I'm just tired. But oh, thank you. That's just, that's a British accent. I don't even know. Okay, we're just gonna go to the next one. Columbia War Machine ninety seven ninety five. Love that guy. Everything is getting more expensive. It does suck. I'm glad I bought the firearms I did when I did. I could not afford them now. Do preach. And by the way, guys, if you um if you haven't checked out Columbia War Machine on YouTube, definitely do so. He's putting out some really cool content. And I think that's it. I think that is all. We did get lots of comments. Lots of people who saw me on Colin Noir show. So appreciate that. Um but yeah. Getting the word out. Yeah, I'm getting that word out. Doing God's work. <laughs> well, nobody wants to hear my accent. It's kind of cockney. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is I could just do all kinds of accents, actually. If you want that New York Jew to come out of me, I'll say no more. <laughs> you remind me of Brian. Was I know. It Fran <laughs> from the nanny. <laughs> I know. I oh, know. my gosh. Yeah. Oh, the, I, that brings back some memories. If I feel like I'm in danger of getting raped, I just bring out that voice and it stops me. <laughs> <It's great. Yeah. laughs> Good all Lord. Right. Yeah. All right. I know. Um, oh. hey, on that note, cheers. Cheers. What's Do we cup? really want to finish talking about the NFA? <laughs> are you are you people out there really interested in the NFA? Well, I think I think they are. We're going to tell you about it anyways, regardless. Mm. Uh, but before we do, guys, visit Caliber Coffee and use the code PUPU for 10% off. That is Caliber Coffee, and this stuff's good. Also, finally, my life's kind of somewhat put together where I, I could get some half and half, so got that working for me. But uh, yeah, cheers. You were finally right, able to get to the grocery store? Mm, yes. When you say grocery store uh, delivery, yes. Cheers to that. I don't <laughs> even want to talk anymore. I'm tired of people, and there's that. But take it away, Chad. Let's talk about the NFA. All right, so last week we discussed... Uh, the history of the NFA, and it was relatively abbreviated. 
and we hit the high points, but there was a lot of detail that could have been covered, but it probably would have bored everybody to death. Um, but wanted to discuss kind of how to get into the NFA because I think a lot of folks that are interested in purchasing sus- uh, suppressors mostly, that's one of the most popular NFA items uh, these days is suppressors. Um, and they're a little unsure of how to go about getting started and what the process is like. Uh, there's some great information out there these days, but you know, some folks just have a hard time like tracking that information down and not only information itself, but good information, right? Yeah. Well, um, and also one thing I do want to say is I can't tell you how many times I've, I've been asked the question like, oh, wait, so civilians can order or like own suppressors mm-hmm. or I mean, even machine guns for that matter if you have enough yeah. money. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff that, that civilians are unaware of that they can own. And it's actually not as, it's actually really easy. And then on top of that, I don't know if you knew this, but right now um, to get a suppressor there, the wait time is like very, very quick. Yeah. And that's to- one reason why I thought that these would be prudent to do now. It's just because mm-hmm. of um, the ATF changing up the system a little bit and kind of improving those wait times it look it sucks having to wait on what is essentially a constitutional right i mean the nfa should never have been put into place anyways um because it violates it violates several several items within the constitution but uh the main thing is the uh the taxing of a right Mm -hmm. and um the way they got around that was um as we discussed in the previous video, we're not going to get back into it. You want to hear about it? Check it out. Um, But anyways, the original uh, episode, it covered uh, all the history. It talked about how the NRA was involved with the original law and subsequent changes that were added in 68 and in 86. Um, And also, yeah, we don't know what the future holds uh, for the NFA as a whole, Um, and especially some items possibly coming off of the NFA. Um, you know, post Bruin. So we're, we're in kind of a, um, an interesting period right now where, you know, Bruin is set precedent basically in the courts. And it's going to be interesting to see, uh, how current laws are being tackled in the courts, uh, as time goes on. It takes a long time to go through that process and to possibly get bills or to get, um, cases up to the Supreme Court. But we've seen, you know, the the bump stock case at the Supreme Court right now still. Um, And we're hoping to see, um, you know, the Brace case, you know, get up there and have some precedent set, um, hopefully in the right direction if, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, common sense prevails. But so just so you don't know, if you didn't hear the last episode, the uh, NFA is the National Firearms Act. It was a law enacted in 1934 that um, basically prohibited the ownership of certain items, suppressors, short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns, machine guns, um, you know, pretty much any, any fun, fun gun out there. Right. Um, and it instituted a tax that, uh, at the time, um, would have equated to like $4,600 in today's dollars, uh, which basically literally just stopped the sale of those items to civilians, to most civilians, unless you were filthy, filthy rich. Um, fast forward to today, the uh, tax, the $200 tax that's associated with registration of these items has not gone up with inflation, and it's ever more popular these days. And there's more people who own NFA items uh, these days than ever before, and mm-hmm. we are getting to that point where like suppressors especially are becoming very, very common use because more people are being educated about them. They understand that you can own these devices and uh, how useful that they are, okay? Um, but anyways, that's kind of the, the basics of the NFA. So I think starting off, um, cause lots of people have no idea where to start. Like, what would you say is the start of the process to get an NFA item? So the first thing is to find a, uh, a dealer who has an SOT. That's a special occupational tax. It's a special permit that they pay for each year. Right. And it allows them to, uh, deal in and manufacture NFA items depending on, the license that they have. Okay. So you find a dealer with these items in stock. Okay. Uh, and you can go and you can check them out, handle them, um, you know, see the various features, uh, the different mounting options and get some information. Um, you know, you can see performance, uh, data online. Um, that could be a whole other episode, but I'll just say this, don't ever trust the performance data 
uh, for suppressors that are listed on the company's website. Go to an independent resource, uh, something like um, Pew Science, you know, Jay over there. He does an excellent job of comparing and contrasting all different types of suppressors, and he has a very uh, consistent um, um, system, okay, for comparing these devices, and he puts everything into a chart. Some of it is a little bit complicated to try to understand, Mm -hmm. but... If you read through it enough, it's kind of like old math where, like, I just don't understand it and it clicks one day. That's kind of the way Pew Science is. But great, great resource. Um, but figure out what you want. Like, And I'm just using suppressors as an example because they're the most common uh, NFI item that's purchased these days. So mm-hmm. once you choose what suppressor you're going to have, most shops these days are either going to have, uh, like, a silencer shop kiosk or they're going to have... Um, a uh, live scan fingerprint machine. Okay. So pretty much everything these days is done electronically. Previously, it oh was my tough. gosh, previously, or, it really sucked. I remember that. Like my yeah. mom, cause, you know, my parents, they, they own a gun store and they've oh, yeah. been, I want to say a class seven or a class three, but you don't like that. So, you know, but they've had their a, SOT. Yeah. And a type seven. Mother- Type, yes. type 07 class. I learned, I learned from the previous episode that I've been missing, uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like it was, I remember like people sitting in my mom's office and she'd have to like fingerprint them and stuff. And Oh yeah, yeah. So paper fingerprint cards, paper forms, like even a manufacturer, you know, the way it used to be, you had to mail in your form twos to yeah. manufacture an item. Um, so it, yeah, it's, it's crazy. I, I will say Silencer Shop has done an excellent job of making this so much easier. They and have, and they've, are, they've really brought it into the mainstream for sure. Yeah, and there's kiosks at most stores. I mean, my, my dad, Dragon Man, so they have the kiosk there. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of a game changer. Yeah, so um, like I said, these days everything's pretty much electronic. The old way was all paper, and it was snail mail, and it sucked. But mm-hmm. people liked it because you get a real stamp like an actual tax stamp on there is like, Oh, I'm not getting any stamps anymore. So <laughs> people used to, stamp collectors is, is a term that was used, but who cares? Who cares? But regardless, um, you go find the dealer, you pick out your item, you get fingerprinted. Now there's no ink involved. It's just an, an electronic scanner, right? And it puts all of your information into a, uh, into a system, into a computer system. And um, you're, your fingerprint card is what um, it, it's converted digitally into what's called an EFT. And the EFT file is, once it's done, it's done. And your fingerprints really don't change. Um, and your photograph is taken digitally now instead of having to go down to, you know, the Kodak store and get a passport photo or a whole book of them and then cut yep. them out and glue them, right? right. Um, but, yeah, your, your, your photograph, your signature, all that's captured digitally. Um, you create an account on Silencer Shop. And I'm just going to talk about the kiosk for a second because it is uh, very convenient. But you create an account, and once you choose your item, it gets assigned to you. And then all the paperwork process is handled by Silencer Shop. And you basically get an email, and you basically just digitally sign with your finger on your phone, you know, through like DocuSign. Mm -hmm. And then you're done, and then the form gets submitted, and you just wait. And then you get a notification at some point that your form's been approved. And then you go down to the dealer and you file a 4473, just like you would if you were transferring a normal gun. But you don't have to go through another background check. There's a selection on the form that this transaction was, um, you know, regarding an NFA transfer. And the background check has already been completed. You sign the form and you're on the way home with your new item, right? Your new NFA item. Um, But... Silencer Shop, especially, uh, like Capital Army, they've really taken the headache out of it. Um, there's some other organizations like Silencer Central. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, they have an FFL presence in every state mm-hmm. that has um, NFA ownership uh, allowances, right? Some states, they ban NFA ownership. You can't own suppressors. You can't own machine guns. Nothing. Uh, like, you know, the fervently anti-gun states, they ban all NFA ownership. Uh, some states, they require you to have um, a Kiro and Relic license if you want to own an SBR. I think maybe Illinois, uh, you know, they have the FOID cards and all that. There's some weird, weird rules out there on a state level. 
But um, if you're in an NFA friendly state, if the company that you're buying from has um, a presence there, you do everything online pretty much. And then you do the 4473 electronically because they have a variance with the ATF for this process. And then your item just gets sent to your door. Like you yeah. never have to set foot outside of your house. Yeah. <laughs> That's the craziest well, thing to me, but hey. I know. No, I could actually confirm this because Silencer okay. Central did. They sent me one and it literally just like, I was like, is this even legal? Like, am I, <laughs> am I being punked right now? Am I being set up by ATF and they're going to see if I accept this? And, but yeah, it, it's like it, they actually came out with like a really like genius way of going about it. And, yeah. and it makes it really easy too. It's a really cool business model for sure. But they do, like I said, they do have to have a presence in every state to be able to yeah. do that. And yeah. I'm not sure if Capital Armory does that as well. They have their own kind of thing going I on, but they're also they a huge do. dealer. Yeah. I think that if anything, I think that they might be competitors, Silencer mm -hmm. Central and Capital Armory. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I think they have a very similar model. I haven't looked too much into it. Yeah. I somehow uh, got signed up for their emails, though. Don't you oh, love boy. when that happens? You're like, how did this? Yeah. How did... But yeah, so. Yeah, I wound up with all kinds of random e emails emails in my box. Um, but that's the, the general process um, in a nutshell. And the same thing goes for like transferring um, like factory SBRs, like short barrel rifles, factory short barrel shotguns, uh, any other weapons, that sort of thing. I briefly touched on this in the last episode, but I'll explain it again. Um, short barrel rifles, barrels under 16 inches are considered short barrel rifles. Shotguns, mm -hmm. anything under 18 inches, all right? 18 inch and above is legal for, you know, a normal shotgun. Anything under is Naughtyville, okay? And requires yeah. you to submit your life to the ATF in order to own it. Um, any other weapons are the goofy things that don't fall into any category, like sword boot shorties, you know, like the little eight inch, uh, eight seventies with a pistol grip on the front and a bird's head on the back. Mm -hmm. They don't have a stock. They don't have this. They don't have a, they don't have the overall length to fall into this category. So well, we're going to stick them over here. Any other weapon, um, destructive devices, anything over 50 cal, you know, 20 millimeters, uh, your 40 millimeter grenade launchers. Like, yes, you can own a 40 millimeter and you can shoot, you know, chalk rounds. Um, you can use the uh, hornet's nest, like the little, the, the, um, the 40 millimeter cases that hold like 20 plus 22 rounds and they all fire at the same time. It's like, dang, <laughs> I mean, this is called like a beehive or a hornet's nest. Um, but that sounds like a lot of fun. Have you shot one is. of those? Yes. They are really cool. I shot a lot of forties, uh, with chalk rounds and they are a ton of fun. And one day, one day I'm going to get myself one. Um, but not today. But yeah. they are a lot of fun. They're a hoot. Um, and then you have, um, yeah, DDs. Oh, and like mortars. Like you can own 60 millimeter mortars. You know, I've, a lot of folks have built their own, which I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, you can transfer anything like that as, as long as it's on the NFA registry. I mean, it, it can be transferred to anybody with the right paperwork. Uh, and like I said, it's unfortunate that that's the process that we have to go through in order to own these items right now. But, you know, post-brewing, hopefully at some point that'll change as long as people continue the advocacy, you know, for these laws to be changed. Mm -hmm. If folks aren't out there doing the work like you're doing right now, then things will just remain the same. I know. Um, and that's a huge unfortunately, thing. It, we're still not seeing as many. I mean, a lot of people reached out to me after I made national news, but... Unfortunately, I'm still not seeing like a huge uptick in people just like getting off their butts and getting active. And it's so annoying. Um, one thing that I think is kind of interesting is it's funny how, you know, they're trying to pass all of these bans, like banning uh, semi automatic pistols, but like they're not trying to ban full autos. Like, I think it's funny that like you could, if you had enough money, you know, if you wanted to fork up let's say on average ten, twenty thousand dollars, you could get a full auto and that's not banned, but you could, you know, they're trying to ban like eighty percent of semi automatic handguns, shotguns, and rifles. Like yeah. and I'm like, doesn't nobody sees like the I don't know, it's kind of funny. Not that I well, want no, them to ban anything, but Yeah, it seems like in some of the states where they've um tried to put forth assault weapons bans in the past or maybe succeeded, um 
they didn't have any any verbiage in the legislation related to the NFA. So if you still no. want to register a machine gun or a short barrel rifle, you could have it. But yeah. it was registered, you know, with the government, with the feds. Um, so that's okay. We know you got know. it. It's okay. Oh. Like um, little, little loophole. Yep, you're welcome. Yep. Save up your money from the piggy bank. I think before moving forward, we should talk about Rossi. So I teamed up with a few content creators and uh, they wanted me to do like this 15 second, like our truck gun. And it was supposed to be funny. At least that's what I thought. I don't know, but we'll see when it comes out. I might be the only one who looks stupid. But of course, I used the Rossi Tuffy, which was that cute little single action 410 45 Colt uh, gun rifle. And oh my goodness, you know, what's so fun. Like, so I, I brought it to the range and I shot it and I shot the 45 Colt and the 410. And what I love about that is like when you go to pop up that little action, it ejects that the, uh, the, you know, the empty casing or the shotgun shell, it ejects it so much. Like you do not want your face in the middle of that. Like if, if I wasn't paying attention, I'm just like, okay, dink, like it would totally get me in my eye or my face or whatever. But it's pretty funny. Um, but that was like a fun little gun. Like, I think honestly, I joke around and I was like, yeah, this is an excellent truck gun. And and then it looks really cute when it ejects and then it like hits my wall and I'm just like, oops, like it was just supposed to be funny. But I think that that actually makes a, for a great truck gun. Like it was just, it was fun to shoot. It's effective. Like if you just need one shot and reloading really wasn't that hard to do uh, on the stock. It has little, you know, slots so that you can put additional like 410 shotgun uh, shells. And I don't know. It was it was fun. I 1010 highly recommend. And I think it's only like $250 or something like that. It was quite affordable. If that actually, it might even be less than that. Um, but they have some really cool stuff. So I would highly recommend checking it out. Rossi, that's R O S S I U S A dot com. All right. So, what we've been discussing right now, or up to this point, is Form 4s. Okay. Form 4, NFA Form 4, is your dealer to consumer transfer form. That's an item off the shelf that's already manufactured being transferred under the NFA to an individual. Um, There's also Form 1s, okay? This is the other type of form that most consumers are going to use. Form 1 is when you want to take your current setup, uh, for example, like you have uh, have a 16-inch AR, okay? And you want to make it an 11.5-inch rifle. Well, really, all you have to do is buy an 11.5-inch upper and go, you know, slap them together. But it's like, Illegal, okay. Yeah. Illegal, okay. So when it's attached, it's no no. When it's in the closet, it's okay. Really, really, okay. Yeah. But but then you file, if you pay the government, to, if you pay the government, then it's okay. Yeah, you pay the government your two hundred dollar extortion tax, and then you're good. Um, yeah. But regardless, a form one is what you submit in order to make that current rifle that's got a you know manufacturer's mark on it serial number already right you're making it into something else so you are known as the maker not the manufacturer in that case so you are the maker of the item foreign ones are for you to make an item into something else and how Um, long does that typically take i heard form ones don't take as long as like some of these other forms yeah, so a lot of the time uh, recently, Form 1s have been much quicker. I'd say probably at least 50% quicker coming back than Form 4s. Because you have to think, there's a ton more Form 4s as far as like ratios go than yeah. there are or Form 4s and Form 1s being submitted, right? Um, and one thing, too, is well, we'll talk about it in a bit, but there's individual versus trust submissions. I definitely want to touch on that, but... Um, those are the two main consumer forms, Form 1s and Form 4s. As far as dealers go, like we have, uh, as a manufacturer, I have Form 2s that I have to submit. Those are when I make an NFA item. Since I'm licensed and I have an SOT, I can manufacture in, uh, NFA items. So I file a Form 2, and I don't have to wait on approval from the government for 
the manufacturer of that item. I'm basically sending them a notification that, hey, I'm well within my right. I made this. Here you go. Put it on the registry. Bye. See you later. Hmm. Okay. Form three is a tax-free dealer-to-dealer, manufacturer-to-dealer transfer form. Um, If I'm purchasing something like a a suppressor from one of my distributors or customer, they file a form three, it gets approved, they mail the suppressor to me, and then I initiate a form four to my customer. Clear as mud. Right, and that's also it's i know so so clear um and that's essentially what would happen to me with me having an sot if somebody wants me to do a review on an nfa item and or like for example iwi they gave me a suppressor or i'm sorry they gave me a tavor x95 sbr Mm -hmm. and so they had to form three it from their sot to my sot yep that's what so, I'm and that's one of the main reasons that I got the FFL and SOT early on in, you know, 2020, 2021 was mm-hmm. to make it easier for our review work on the channel because I, I'd been an RP, a responsible person on another FFL, um, which was nice, but I wanted my own to make things a little bit easier. Uh, but before that, like if we wanted to review a suppressor or we wanted to do like a meltdown or something with a machine gun, we had to have somebody out there babysitting the gun from you know, the FFL who owned that item. Um, so it was, you know, difficult to schedule and everything. And now I've kind of turned the FFL into this business here, but that's mm-hmm. neither here nor there. So yeah. what if, okay, I have, I, have an, an, I have an interesting question. So I have my SOT and my FFL. Um, what if I wanted to start making, okay, like let's say all the brace stuff was going on still. Mm-hmm. So I refuse to, you know, when they have that amnesty period and they were like, hey, if you have a brace on your gun, you need to register as an SBR. We're going to waive the $200 tax fee. I was like, yeah, I'm not falling for that. I'm not I'm not doing any of that crap. But let's say I didn't want to be seen with a brace just to avoid any conflicts with ATF and I wanted to put a brace on it. Was there anything that I could have done having my SOT and my FFL in order to just... Could I have, what would it have been, uh, a form two? Could I have form two to, or not because I don't have my manufacturing license? Yeah. Well, so I, if I remember correctly, during that period, the mm-hmm. ATF was just wanting any of those items to be registered. Yeah. And I I want to say that as a dealer, you were not able to do that. I think you had to just pull the braces off. Um, but. I don't remember during that time time frame. Yeah. I know that was yeah. kind of a weird stipulation. They had a bunch of weird. Oh, um, it was. I mean, there were so many gray areas. So it was just, yeah, it was like setting people up for failure, like typical law where, you know, people are trying to follow the law and be law abiding yeah. citizens. And then it's just well, like, well, you didn't really follow it to a T. And it's like, well, how right. are you supposed to when it's so vague? I'll say that on the consumer side, that particular rule was extremely confusing. But on the, on the dealer and manufacturer side, it was like, it was literally yeah. clear as mud. And yeah. I'm sitting here scratching my head, like going through it time and time again, going, they said, what? You yeah. can, make, what? You don't have to market what? It was yeah. ridiculous. Um, but currently, if you don't have an 07, which is your manufacturer's FFL, mm-hmm. your manufacturing FFL, you cannot convert uh, an item like a pistol into a short barrel rifle. Um not without having another man, like basically you'd have to transfer it to another manufacturer. Yeah. They'd have to manufacture it under their FFL and SOT. And once they get the form two uh, approved on it, they could um, transfer it to you on a form three. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's kind of how that would work. Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, clear as mud. That's, <laughs> that's kind of the common theme. Yeah. Um, so, just the general synopsis of Form 1s, Form 4s, the NFA process, as you guys can see or some of you can hear, like it's a relatively easy process these days. And yes, the common misconceptions, like Ava mentioned earlier in the episode, uh, of you know these items being illegal is a complete farce. Mm-hmm. Um, these items are definitely legal, okay? And the more people know about that, the better because then they realize that, Hey, maybe everything I've been told about guns my entire life is not entirely true. And this is kind of how you get that conversation started with folks who might be on the fence about guns. 
and kind of get them into the fold and, and recruit them to the right side, <laughs> you know, yeah. but, um, there's two different ways to go about, uh, collecting your NFA items. Okay. You can do it on an individual basis, or you can do it with what's known as an NFA trust or a gun trust. Um, as an individual, um, you are the sole owner of those items. Okay. If they're going to be used by anyone else, you have to physically be present. You can't leave those items with somebody else or let, you know, Joe Bob down the road, borrow them or, you know, leave them out at home when you're away because the items are registered to you. Okay. So it's not like the ATF is going to come knock down your door because you step foot outside of your, you know, uh, house and you left your SBR sitting outside of the safe or whatever, they're not going to, you know, black helicopters aren't going to come and snatch you up. Like, that's a huge misconception that the ATF is over everybody's shoulder going, you're supposed to do that. (laughs) It doesn't happen. They really, look, in a lot of cases, like, the stuff that people concern themselves with, especially on some of the forums, like, it doesn't matter. It really Mm -hmm. doesn't. Um, But regardless... That's the individual thing, all right? And um, as far as estate planning goes, um, you know, you collect a bunch of NFA items over the course of your lifetime. Uh, You know, you wind up, you pass away, okay? We're all going to die one day. You pass away, and you have children that you've willed those items to, okay? They are the beneficiaries of of that collection. Um, The NFA items in question can be transferred tax-free using a special form, okay? And, but you still have to go through that process, fingerprints, photographs, the whole nine yards. It's just like doing a normal thing for. And essentially I would imagine it's a whole long list of stuff. Like every little item is going to have its paperwork attached to it. Yes. So that's one thing I forgot to mention. Every single item has a form four attached Mm -hmm. to it. Okay. It's, and this is another thing I think we touched on last episode, but there's no like class three license for individuals where you just get a class three and then you can buy all this stuff. Each item has a form associated with it and it has an associated transfer tax associated with it or making tax depending on the form. Um, so like fast forward to trusts. Okay. A gun trust is a legal entity that you assign property to, okay? And there's many outlets that can uh, produce a trust for you, the documentation. Uh, Most attorneys that are active within the firearms realm um, Mm -hmm. can do them for you. Uh, Here in Georgia, we have NFA lawyers. Uh, His name is Dean Phillips. I believe Dean Phillips. Uh, Yeah, Dean Phillips. So he did my trust years ago, and he's constantly improved them to make it easier to... um, you know, send off to the ATF. It's a very short form. It's only like 11 pages. Um, but within that trust, you can assign responsible persons, you know, trustees. Okay. And like on my trust, it's myself and my wife as trustees and then my children are beneficiaries. So as of right now, like I can legally leave my home and I can leave an item out if I leave a suppressor sitting out or something, or if I've got it in the workshop outside locked up, or whatever, she's technically in legal possession of that item because she's a trustee. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's some complications with trusts, but the biggest uh, benefit is estate planning. So when my children become uh, adults, when they turn 18, I can uh, convert them from a beneficiary to a responsible person or trustee, right? And that just is a simple filing of a piece of paper and basically attaching it to the trust and signing it. Um, they can be in possession of any of my NFA items, um, you know, themselves at the range or whatever at the age of 18, all right? Uh, You can't transfer an NFA item until you're 21, okay? It's just like buying a handgun in most places. But at 18, they can be on the trust and they can be in legal possession of my, my stuff. And then one day when I pass away, everything is owned by the trust, so there's no additional paperwork that has to be filed. Because it just transfers down the line, um, you know, to and trustee, so they to trustee, could, to trustee. Gotcha. And they could always add people to that once yes. they, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So you can add, you can remove, you can change the status of individuals on the trust. Uh, like I said, it's a legal entity. And it's, to me, it's it's the 
best way to you know collect NFA stuff. But I will say, once you start doing a trust, I'd suggest not to mix and match and do some things individually and then do some stuff on the trust. Keep it consistent because, remember, if you transfer some things as an individual and then down the line you decide to get it a gun trust, you want to move all your personal items into that trust. Well, that's another transfer uh, form and tax associated with each of those items just mm-hmm. to move it from one entity to another, right? Or an individual to an entity. Um, so every time it's transferred, it, form four, 200 bucks. 200 bucks, yeah. Yeah. So, makes sense. But you just have to figure out what is the best route to go. Um, I've suggested to a lot of younger customers of mine that it's beneficial for them to go ahead and start a trust because eventually they'll probably have a family and they'll probably, you know, their kids will probably be into guns and it's great for estate planning. And like I said, it's the, it's the biggest yeah. reason. It's just the estate well, planning aspect of it. Not to mention, you know, all of these NFA items, even if it's a suppressor, it's still expensive. You know, we're talking yeah. about average 500 plus a, a suppressor. Yeah. And so the last thing you'd want is, you know, something to happen. I mean, even if I don't have a family or, or kids, I would want, you know, my stuff to go to probably my sister or, you know, a family member. And so it just makes it easier. It does for sure. Um, now, one thing, one stipulation is that uh, forms that have a trust associated with them, okay, usually take longer to process than forms on uh, an individual basis. So if you if you file a form four as an individual, usually they're pretty quick, right? Trusts usually take a little longer. Like for example, if uh, prior to this this new system and processing, you know, strategy that the ATF is using, whatever you want to call it. Um, normal uh, individual forms were taken somewhere around like maybe five to seven months, roughly. Trusts were still taken like eight to 10 months. Okay. Mm-hmm. They were just taking longer, especially if you have more people on that trust. This is one of the downsides to a trust. The more people you have on the trust as a responsible, as responsible persons, each one of those individuals has to submit uh, what's called a responsible person's questionnaire. And what that is, is basically, it's like the same information that you would submit for like a background check, including your fingerprint cards and your passport photo for each person on the trust. And is this every time or is this just a one-time thing? Every time. Gotcha. Yep. So So every time you purchase another NFA item, they all have to go through this. Yeah, but the benefit of the electronic system is that, you know, an RPQ, uh, Responsible Persons Questionnaire, can be, you know, kind of pre-filled, and all mm-hmm. you have to do is go in and change the make model serial and, like, overall length of the item in question, um, and then everything else is the same, right? And your photo has to be updated once a year, but, like, Silencer Shop has a service for this, and basically everybody's associated with that trust, when, when an item is assigned through Silencer Shop, they know, like, okay, this is the trust, nothing's changed, okay, here we go, off off into the wild blue yonder to be processed. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit more complicated to get the forms together, but in the, in the end, I still think it's a huge benefit over doing things on an individual basis for estate planning. I, I just can't stress that enough. I really feel like it's um, it's really great. Um, to have everything in a trust. And you don't have to just keep NFA items in the trust. You can put uh, your standard, like, Title I guns, you know, normal firearms in the trust as well, and all that kind of goes back to that estate planning aspect of it. So Hmm. That's good to know. Anyways. All right, perfect. All right, well, I think that probably sums up this topic. Uh, I'm curious if you guys want to know anything else that revolves around the NFA, any questions about, I don't know, I think at one point, you know, in the future, we should probably talk about like probably best suppressor because that's a question that I get often. And like you said, you know, if you go to their website, they all claim to be the best. But, um, you know, there's there's some third party companies out there, independent parties out there that are doing their testing and it says otherwise, which I thought is, you know, it's been interesting. Or if you shoot them side by side, you know, going to an event and shooting it side by side. I'm like, man, that is such a difference. So we'll have to discuss that as well. Well, we um, could definitely fill up an entire episode and I'm not sure, I'm not sure this audience is ready for my talk on suppressors. <laughs> I know, I know. 
Um, and then also figuring out uh, all the mounting system and all that stuff, because that's also something that, you know, could add a lot of confusion that deterred me for the longest time. But uh, we will definitely continue this topic uh, probably in the next couple of weeks. But in the meantime, um, before we wrap up, I do want to talk about our listener of the week. So we did have one review uh, as of recently, and this is from, I feel like we've heard from this person before, but, or maybe I'm thinking from, from gun funny, but Gonzo 150413 titled great show, five stars, always interesting. So short, sweet, but I'll take it. So we do appreciate all of the reviews. If you guys want to do so really easy, especially if you have an iPhone, just head on over to uh, the podcast app, search for Pew Pew Panel, scroll to the bottom, you'll see where it says reviews, and then you'll have to write out a review in order for it to populate. But we do appreciate it. And eventually, we're going to pick a lucky winner out of all of the previous reviews. So stay tuned for that. Um, also, head on over to our sponsors. We'll tell them we said hi. That's Calibra Coffee. If you use the code Pew Pew Rossi, visit RossiUSA.com and Gideon Optics. And that is GideonOptics.com. And on that note, I think we're out of here. We appreciate you guys watching. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't. And uh, and let us know what topics you would like to hear from us, uh, you know, that you, that you would like us to cover moving forward. So, Reach out, y'all.